Uh, about 8% are African American and 8.7% are others who report mixed races. So uh, what I do know is a lot of the ECG criteria, a lot of other criteria over the years have been uh, developed largely for uh, white populations, European uh, origin populations, and we have a chance using this uh, screening tool, this screening registry, to start to examine some uh, uh, differences by ethnicity, particularly some of the issues raised earlier about why African Americans uh, seem to be at a higher risk for sudden cardiac death. Wide range of sports, it's, it's, it's Texas, uh, and that means a lot of high school football, and that uh, almost half of our athletes uh, came, uh, came to us based on their interest or current participation in high school football. Second, uh, uh, European football or soccer, basketball, and, and, and others you can see here. Uh, it, it, so it's not just a single sport. The purpose is hard to interpret the slide. It's not just a single sport, but it is a true cross-section of athletes uh, in a wide variety of, of high school organized sports. So what kind of data do we have? The, the, the follow-up data on this is actually being presented on Monday at the American Heart Association meeting in Anaheim. Uh, so I can only give a, a, a peek. I can give uh, some, uh, and so as not to present it before it's presented there, I can give a peek at what kind of things we're looking at. Of the 3,200 or so, 3,181 total screen, 8.3% uh, were referred for further cardiology workup. 6.9% uh, due to the ECG and 1.7% due to abnormal echo findings. Uh, which, uh, as I said, these two are not overlapping. The 1.7% would be in addition to the 6.9% that were found from the ECG. Um, in this particular case, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, uh, of those who were screened and referred, again, the 8.3%, 2.1% were referred specifically for suspected hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, and 6.1% for other sudden cardiac death related conditions, either echo or uh, ECG, uh, sus other suspected uh, conditions. So again, we're right in the area. I think the unique part of this is that it's a younger population and they're certainly not all elite athletes. And, and uh, one of the unique things is we're, we're, we're investigating this and in fact registering these people to follow them up over time uh, to bring them back and, and to uh, reassess and reanalyze any potential changes. Uh, the hardest part of this, as you might imagine, and in fact why people don't work with denominators as much, is the follow-up. Uh, people get uh, uh, in these community screenings, it's a large event, there's hundreds of people running through and there's lots of uh, personnel and so forth. Following up on the referred people to actually see what's happening and confirm some of the diagnoses is where, as we know, the meat of this is. We've been able to, to uh, figure out that 90% of the follow-up, 90% 90, 90 or 236 of 263 who were referred uh, had some kind of a follow-up. 66% of those actually went to a cardiologist, but importantly, 25% chose not to follow up. And so there's a difference between not knowing what happened and knowing that they chose not to go to a cardiologist. And I think that's a new piece of data that, uh, that we can add to the literature here. The reasons were varied, uh, don't bother me. Uh, no, I'm not, uh, I don't believe the findings or we don't have any worries, we don't have health insurance. Uh, there's a lot of different ones, but uh, I, th I think that's a group that needs to be really focused on. We're still looking to find the, fi the final 10% that's in progress as we're going. Um, and, and again, of those who actually followed up uh, with the cardiologist, 77 or 45% had findings confirmed one way or, or another. Uh, we're still waiting for the, the uh, we're, we're not relying on self-report for the cardiologist findings. We're going to the actual physicians and, and uh, getting those, those findings together. So what we're trying to do in Austin and in, and in Texas in general is, is figure out if this kind of large-scale community screening of high school athletes, not uh, athletes who are uh, elite or professional, uh, is possible, number one, and if it can be done with both ECG and ECHO. Uh, it does appear that it does um, identify SCD-related re conditions and is feasible. We have not yet done cost-effectiveness. Uh, obviously, there is additional costs associated with uh, personnel and, and machinery and other kinds of things as well, direct costs and indirect costs associated with adding the echo to these screenings. Um, I do think, though, the fact that we found some potential referrals by echo and not ECG is an important clinical finding that 
suggest that we might be looking at different types of referral patterns. Um, the natural history of the athletes deemed free of such abnormalities at times to be screened or at screening time remains to be determined. For example, is there anyone who, couldn't, who was screened at age 14 or uh, who may, might have converted when they were age 16 or 17 with some different uh, uh, different pathologies? And the registry, I think, will help us understand that. Maybe taking an, a random sample of, of normals and following them up again and, and, and asking the same question. Our future goals, uh, and one of the papers that is uh, also another paper that's being presented at the Heart Association is some new normative data for ECG measures, uh, especially ventricular hypertrophy in this, uh, in this group of athletes. And uh, we're analyzing the data by different ethnicities. Uh, we can, I think, use these data to establish normative 2D echo data for uh, LVM mode measurements, dimensions, mass, and volume, and so forth in this population. Establish a database, maybe not national first, but certainly uh, in Texas. And then this registry is again where I'm most interested in following these people, uh, seeing what happens over time, even into adulthood and further on, uh, using more current methods of social networking and, and, and things to try to keep up with people to see what's happening uh, with the, the screening results over time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Bill. Uh, one of the other things I've got the impression of in the States in terms of follow-up is that people move around an awful lot too, and I can well imagine that will create yet another factor uh, for you. So our last uh, speaker who I've given a very difficult job to is Maria Brosnan, who's the cardiologist to, who's doing a PhD on the athlete uh, cardiac abnormalities. And uh, I've given her the difficult job of trying to tie all this together and giving us some insights with some of which you gave us this morning, I'm sure, on the Athlete ECG, but thank you, Maria. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks for coming. Yeah, look, I don't know if I've, what I've put together, whether it really ties things up, but we'll just take it as it comes and have a chat about it. Oh, from my slides. Brendan contacted me a while ago and told me presentations that we're going to be on today and just asked for a summary to sort of tie things together. And one of the things that I thought was important to point out from the outset is who we're actually talking about when we talk about sudden cardiac death in athletes. Um, and we're talking about two distinct groups, so either young competitive athletes, and that's you know the athlete under the age of 35. Um, the definition of competitive varies widely, as <coughs> has already been alluded to today. A lot of the larger studies that have been done have been on very much sub-elite athletes, so you know, your kid who plays soccer a couple of hours a week as opposed to your elite athlete who trains for 10 to 15 hours a week. And it's becoming clear that they're actually pretty distinct populations, but nevertheless, they're still the people, they're the population that are at risk of dying um, from inherited or congenital cardiac conditions. And just to make it clear from the outset, not talking about over 35s, and I'll talk about, it's mainly because over 35s die of premature primary disease, not these other, um, uh, cardiomyopathies and, and uh, channelopathies. But uh, there's certainly a lot of interest in, in the over 35s and at, at a recent European conference, a lot of talk which is actually now swinging to how should you screen the over 35s for premature coronary disease. And especially because there's this emerging, emerging phenomenon of mammals or uh, middle-aged men in micro. So Google mammal and a picture of Brendan actually came up. Um, I, I had never met him before, but uh, he told me he rides a bit, but clearly not very much. Um, so yeah. The, the, as I said, the distinction is that older people die of ischemic heart disease. Overall, although the risk of sudden cardiac death for anyone when you exercise is transiently increased, in the over 35s, overall exercise is cardiac protective. However, in the under 35 um, population, in a small number who have underlying, usually completely silent um, cardiac conditions, when you exercise, there's a transit increase risk in sudden cardiac death. And in fact, if you're someone who has a disease has, for instance, a cardiomyopathy, you're five times more likely to die if you're an athlete than you are if you're a sedentary person who happens to have that um, condition. 
So I think some of these numbers have already been sort of discussed before, and I guess the first thing to point out is that in Australia we have no idea what the incidence of sudden cardiac death is in our young population. We currently don't keep a registry. Um, we're poor at doing autopsies. There is a, a bloke called Chris Samsari in Sydney who's a cardiologist and a geneticist essentially who's developed a registry for sudden cardiac death in under 35s and they're actually recording whether or not the, the um, people are athletic. There is some data on the causes of sudden cardiac death in under 35s but we've never collected information about athletic activity. Um, as was already alluded to earlier, we know that there are uh, geographic and ethnic variations in both um, the incidence and the causes of sudden cardiac death with um, black male athletes being apparently the most at risk. And um, Jeff already mentioned that nice study from um, Young and his workers in uh, the late 90s which just looked at a series of sudden cardiac deaths in young Indigenous Australian footballers, all of which happened on the field. Um, and they were all premature coronary disease in guys that were under the age of 25. And that's an important point to make because uh, I think Mark's alluded to the fact that we aren't seeing a lot of ECG abnormalities in our Indigenous population. However, arresting ECG is a completely insensitive test for um, premature coronary disease, so there may actually be a population that needs special consideration and different screening tools because it's a pretty um, horrendous uh, figure and we know that that population is predisposed to not just ischemic heart disease but diabetes and other things that are more For um, reasons that are incompletely understood, we know that uh, uh, males, uh, the, the incidence of sudden cardiac death in males is almost tenfold that of females. That, that could partly be explained by sports participation rates, but not entirely, and, and so those reasons aren't really understood. The mean age of death is really hard to know because it depends uh, where the study was done, and a lot of the stuff that's come out of the US has been just on registries of only college age athletes, so obviously the mean age of death in those series is around 17. However, the, the Italian series, the mean age of death was 23. Two thirds of those were under the age of 20, and one third of those were under the age of 16. And these are important numbers to keep in mind, particularly when we're screening adolescents in whom disease presentations are going to be really subtle. Um, and some of the conditions we're talking about, the classic presentations, late teens, early 20s, drops dead. Um, so there's no symptoms, no signs, kind of sudden cardiac death. Um, the autopsy series that have been done, depending where they've been done and what series, up to 30% uh, at autopsy have had a morphologically normal heart. So the heart looks structurally normal. Um, presumably, uh, many of these uh, are due to potentially iron channel apathy, so disorders of electrical conduction, which don't cause structural abnormalities and you can't diagnose post-mortem unless they have an ECG before they die or you're able to do genetic testing, which actually identifies. And that's another part of what Chris and Sarah is doing. They're doing uh, molecular autopsies on everyone who dies as well. So actually running a lot of the diseases that uh, cause sudden cardiac death have identifiable genes in at least half of them, so they're running all of those through on these people who die, and then that actually has really important implications to follow up to the family, and that's something at the moment that we don't do very well. The most common autopsy proven cause of sudden cardiac death are cardiomyopathies, and there's a geographic variation in this. In the um, US study, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is consistently the most common autopsy finding. So that's just an abnormal thickening of the left ventricle that causes electrical disturbance and death is usually from VT that degenerates into VF. As opposed to the Italian series which found uh, most of their autopsy findings have uh, been called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which to be honest is a, a disease which we still think is relatively rare and has only really been recognised in the last 20 years. Um, can be quite difficult to diagnose even with imaging studies because the findings can be quite subtle. And essentially it's just a fibro fatty replacement for part of the right ventricle that causes electrical disturbances. Both of those conditions are autosomal dominant, so they're running families. If your parent carries a gene, you have a 50% chance of um, inheriting it. So that's why, although history and examination aren't often that helpful, a family history can be really important and important to actually get the family in, or rather than asking a 14-year-old kid, is anyone in the family ever died, actually ask the parents and relatives. Uh, a significant number of autopsy findings include premature coronary disease and congenital coronary anomalies, and they're actually really hard to diagnose pre-mortem, so they'll have normal ECGs, normal examinations, usually have no symptoms. The iron channel apathies, however, often an ECG can be diagnostic. And a significant number of um, autopsy findings have been that of myocarditis, and that's essentially just the inflammation of the heart muscle following usually a viral infection. In you know, the form we see in hospital, you know, they're really crook in heart failure, but the more subtle forms are just someone who's had a viral illness the week before, feels a bit rough, um, 
that the heart's inflamed and they're at risk of arrhythmias uh, when they're exercising. So um, Mark and already showing you this slide. I think I'll just talk a little bit more about it. This is the data that screening is basically based on, or screening inclusive and ECG is based on. So essentially, in 1979, in, in uh, Benedo, which is in northeast Italy, Caucasian population, about 5 million people, they uh, noticed that the, they started a registry, so every, um, everyone under the age of 35, regardless of their athletic activity, if they died suddenly, they had a thorough um, <coughs> verbal history taken, in, um, you know, information about the person, whether they're an athlete or not, the context of the death, and also a thorough autopsy. And they noticed at that time that um, the young athletic population were four times more likely to suffer a sudden cardiac death than the sedentary population. So in 1981, they introduced pre-participation screening. And pre-participation screening in Italy is mandated by law, which for us is pretty hard to fathom. It's uh, funded by the state government, so if you're under the age of 18, it's free. If you're over the age of 18, you pay a, a trivial amount. And they've set up these uh, sports cardiology centres that are purely focused on this. So it's infrastructure that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So they started screening in uh, 1981, and what they gradually saw over a 25 year period was that the incidence of sudden cardiac death in the screened athletic population dropped down to a level just below that of um, the rate in the unscreened non-athletic population. And what was that reduction due to? Well, most of it was due to um, a reduction in deaths from arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which as I've just said is thought to be a rare condition in other parts of the world. And a big, uh, many an argument from the US has been that all they've done is identify a cluster of a familial disease. Um, but against that is the fact that the, the sudden cardiac death rates in the unscreened population remain quite stable. Um, and the fact that not many people are dying of heart hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the Italian series is probably because they're picking them up on screen and have been quite early on. ARVC was something that was only really recognised in you know, 10 years into the study. So it's a relatively new entity. What I should also say about the study, and I think I was going to mention it later as well, in doing that, they're very conservative. They place athletic, because the whole point of screening is to identify someone with an abnormality and stop them from playing sport so they don't drop, drop dead playing sport. We don't have great data on what happens to them in the long term. And in the Italian series, 2% of athletes who are screened are restricted from sports activity. 2%. One tenth of those were because they had uh, a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The other 90% were for things like you know, um, lots of ventricular ectopics, um, arrhythmias, um, and there's no data on what's happened to them in the long term. There's some subject, from now on, because they've had 25, 30 years follow up, we know that the people diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are mostly still alive. Uh, but what happens to the others? So that's you know, something to sort of chew on when you're thinking about screening. But, however, the argument for ECG screening as opposed to um, ECG screening just with history and examination, as is still the recommendation from the American Heart Association, so their AHA guidelines suggest that, that screening is warranted, but they wouldn't go further than a history and examination. And it's, it's very clear that a history and examination alone will miss most of these cases. Um, pretty much it's good at um, identifying people with family history, and it picks up people with nervous who might have valvular heart disease. And, you know, valvular heart disease may be implicated in some cardiac deaths, but the, the bulk of it, as I said, is cardiomyopathies and iron-channel disease, and you're not going to pick those up in a 14-year-old kid with a history and examination. Most athletes who suffer sudden cardiac death will have had a normal examination and will have had absolutely no symptoms prior to dropping death. But as I said, up to 90% of subjects with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or ARVC will have ECG abnormalities. The ECG abnormalities early in the disease can be pretty subtle, um, and we know that the ECG is actually probably almost a more sensitive test than an echo, uh, well it is a more sensitive test than an echo for early cardiomyopathy. The ECG changes can precede the structural changes on echo by up to five years. Um, so this is a real problem when you're talking about screening a young population with juvenile patterns of ECGs that can mimic disease and then how to follow them up in, in the long term and how often to, how often to follow them up. And as we've already discussed, um, you know, when you're looking at athletes' ECGs, they're not normal. Uh, the heart's a muscle, so when you exercise, the muscle adapts to exercise and it changes the way the ECG looks. Uh, and as a result of this, you know, criteria are being created to try to help improve the sensitivity and specificity of ECG interpretation in athletes, but there's still you know, some holes in the criteria. The most current guidelines that we use came out in 2010 and were put out by the um, European um, 
Cardiac Society, dividing changes into either training related, common, seen in lots of athletes, don't require further investigation, or uncommon, training unrelated ECG changes, which may be indicative of a disease. For instance, T1 inversion, ST segment depression, Q waves, their changes typically seen in diseases such as Hockham and AOVC. And obviously, the um, iron channelopathies can be pretty easily diagnosed with an ECG. However, the problem is um, that some of these uncommon changes are actually quite common. Um, and in particular, in different um, racial populations. And as Bill's just spoken about, um, black male athletes in particular have very abnormal patterns of early repolarization with deep T wave inversion. In a quarter of them extending from B1 to B4, and in about 8% of them extending beyond that. So, really, really abnormal ECG patterns that you think were indicative of disease in a, in a Caucasian person. And even in adult white athletes, 2.5% will have um, T wave inversions, which are considered abnormal. And when you're looking at um, people under the age of 14, so prepubescent athletes, their rates of T wave inversion are even higher. Um, so, there's obviously an issue with starting screening in kids under the age of 14. Um, Things like uh, atrial enlargement and ventricular hypertrophy and voltage criteria, in particular in adolescent athletes, uh, are probably pretty inaccurate. So we see them in a lot and they don't all have pathological hypertrophy. However, the criteria that have been made are sort of blanket criteria to apply to everyone. Uh, and what we've seen so far with, um, so basically the bulk of the PhD has been screening so far about 1,300 mostly elite Australian athletes. And there are definitely patterns of difference between, depending on the type of sport, and really it's endurance versus non-endurance, so high volume, high intensity, lots of hours, um, they tend to get more marked uh, ECG at the moment. Um, and I've already sort of alluded to this, uh, one of the big points of contention is um, the juvenile pattern of uh, T-wave inversion, and the ESC criteria suggests actually that any T-wave inversion beyond V1 is abnormal, there's a lot of contention about T-wave inversion isolated to V1 and V2, but that aside, T-wave inversion that extends beyond V2, um, a lot of cardiologists when they look at an ECG and they saw that it was a 16 year old would just say, well that's just a juvenile pattern of, of, um, of an ECG. The problem however is in early cardiomyopathy, often that is the only thing they're going to find that's abnormal, so it's the only marker of a potential underlying cardiomyopathy. So if you're going to screen, if you're going to bother to screen, you have to actually consider that as an abnormality. Um, in most cases they'll turn out to be normal, but you're going to miss your positives if you call all of them um, a juvenile pattern. And there's certainly been a couple of studies, uh, one from the UK and one from Italy, suggesting that it's not actually that common for, um, post, for over 14s to have that kind of T-wave inversion. And of the people who had it, um, they did identify a significant number that actually had an underlying cardiomyopathy, and the T-wave inversion was the only abnormality on the screen. Um, so, as I said, always uh, requires further research. Now, uh, Mark's already alluded to this, um, and um, Jeff has alluded to this. Um, who looks at the ECG really matters. Um, it can't be assumed that every cardiologist knows how to interpret um, athlete ECGs, and I can tell you that we don't. Um, I know a lot more about it now because I'm doing my PhD on it, but I can tell you a lot of my department wouldn't know. Uh, if you send an ECG off to a pathology collection centre, uh, it's often not with you know, healthy athlete screening ECG, it'll just be an ECG that appears on the screen and it will be reported as an ECG. So it will say LVH, it will say S2 segment elevation excludes skin because you don't know that it's early polarisation in a in young healthy athlete. So that's the first important point to, point to make. And the second one is that um, the diseases that we're looking for are actually quite rare and we're not used to seeing lots and lots of ECGs with those abnormalities. Uh, and some people some cardiologists and a lot of sports physicians would actually be unaware of some of the diseases that are associated with sudden cardiac death and may never have seen a case of it in their, in their working group. There was a um, nice little paper by John Dresner basically on this point. He took uh, 40 ECGs, 28 that were normal with normal athletic changes, 12 with pathological sort of patients with disease, and gave them to 60 different physicians, including a number of cardiologists and sports medicine doctors none of them had really been briefed in how to interpret athlete ECGs, and they were all pretty poor um, at interpreting the athlete ECGs blindly. Um, however, with the aid of a, an ECG interpretation tool, which was essentially based on those 2010 ESC criteria, um, the accuracy improved. Um, now, another, another point that we haven't really covered yet, but I think is important, is what to do when you made a diagnosis. 
from Waterford. Uh, and just quickly, one that comes up often, this contention between uh, US guidelines and European guidelines, and one that comes up to two common scenarios, uh, someone who carries a gene for something like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that hasn't expressed the disease, so genotype positive, phenotype negative. In Europe, they would stop them from, restrict them from all competitive sports. And asymptomatic pre-excitation, so asymptomatic, so the pattern of pre-excitation without our uh, And in Europe, they would suggest that um, electrophysiology is mandatory. This is a nice meta-analysis that's come up recently, and I mentioned it this morning, but if you're interested, you should read it. But it's essentially saying that if in people with um, asymptomatic pre-excitation, they're actually at very low risk of sudden cardiac death in the long term. The risk of an EP procedure is probably about equivalent. So ultimately, it comes down to, to you know, a sensible discussion with the athlete, risk gratification, but not rushing off to have you know, your accessory pathway later. Um, now, as I alluded to before, just one other figure to think about. Um, there's been some new UK estimates that, as I mentioned, you know, in Italy they restrict 2% of the athletes. You need to restrict 791 athletes to save one life. And what we don't think about, what I think Bill has their study is fantastic to be following these people up in the long term. What happens to the other people who are restricted? Are we saving their lives or are we cocking up their lives because they're living a sedentary lifestyle, scared to be active? And that's a really important uh, point to consider. job of trying to wind it all together in a relatively short time and give us some overviews and anyone who did attend the Athlete ECG workshop this morning it was uh, really excellent. She's put uh, 15 on us on the spot as well which was great. And so we've got a question so perhaps come up to the microphone and tell us who you are and then the question please. Hi, I'm Catherine Ray, I'm a sports physician in Sydney. Um, I was just going to ask about bradycardia which is less than 60, but how low do you accept? And also with all these cardiac changes, if someone was at a very elite level and then stopped training, do you expect them to continue, such as bradycardia, and how long for? Yeah. Do you want me to answer that? Um, look, it's pretty common to see heart rates down to 30 at rest. So the answer is down to 30 at rest, <laughs> asymptomatic, we consider normal. Below 30, I, I haven't actually really seen very much, so but I'm sure it happens if they're well rested. But generally, we don't get excited at all about bradycardia. Also, except uh, sinus pauses up to three seconds, and you see that not uncommonly because they'll often have sinus arrhythmia with, with their sinus bradycardia. Uh, the second part of the question about do the changes regress? Yes, they do, but not entirely. So um, you'll still see people with some form of bradycardia, but it all comes down to whether or not they've got symptoms. Um, you know, if you've got an 18 year old kid with a heart rate of 36 and they feel fine, then leave them alone. Thanks, Maria. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Any other comments from the panel? Uh, so, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Andrew, Andrew Potter, sports physician from Adelaide. Question two, Maria, uh, related to repeated screenings, and that's the, the questions we all had. Um, I guess it, it's related to the development of and the progression of the diseases. Yeah. How often and for how long yeah. if you are going to screen? Yeah. And the answer, that's a really good question. I think it's something we all need to think about. Um, and there is no, there's no answer to it. We don't have evidence for any sort of answer, so you have to be a bit practical. In Italy, they screen their under 18s every year. If that were feasible, I guess it makes sense in a way, but it's certainly not going to be cost effective. Um, I think in, a, in an elite sports program, under 18s, you'd certainly want to repeat their screening, ideally yearly, so ECG examination. But in order to uh, really use your resources well, the people that have abnormalities, make sure that they are followed up. So focus your resources on those. So if you've got a 14-year-old kid who had a normal T-wave inversion, make sure that they're followed up yearly because they may be, if it's juvenile pattern of ECG change, it'll go away. You might see when they're 16, that pattern's gone away. But if it was an early expression of disease, you'll see those changes develop. Um, so in an ideal world, under 18 should screen every year over 18 to maybe every couple of years. And I think once you get to the age of 25, yearly screening is probably fairly futile. I know Mark mentioned um, we do see athletes later in life who have trouble with um, arrhythmias, but you're not going to pick them up on a resting ECG, and often, most often their resting ECG is normal. So really that's on a case-by-case -case basis. It's, when I talk about repeating it, um, 
second yearly and over 18, so that's in asymptomatic individuals, so you have to put it in context. If someone develops new symptoms, it's all, they realise there's a family history of Hocken, the ballpark changes completely. Thanks, Maria. Another question over here. Hi, I'm at Fee in a uh, local GP. About 10 years ago, a good friend of mine was um, uh, found to have uh, Hogan um, and was restricted from um, continuing in AFL and uh, subsequently died uh, a year or so later. Um, so my question is, you know, aside from picking these people up and um, excluding them from physical activity, what, what else needs to be done? Uh, you know, I mean, should we be putting uh, defibrillators in some of these people? Oh, look, the, that's a separate issue about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and there are a set of criteria. If you have a patient who's diagnosed with it, obviously they, they become a patient. Um, there are high, there are different categories of risk in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So basically, if they've ever had um, the criteria goes something like if they've ever had a syncope or a documented ventricular arrhythmia, they're high risk and they need a defibrillator. If they have a history of um, premature sudden cardiac death in their family, they're also considered high risk. But I had a patient the other day who's 60 years old, the septum's only 14 millimetres thick, she's never had an arrhythmia, just put her on a beta blocker. Um, she doesn't need a defibrillator. There's, it's, a, it's a really interesting disease and a disease where the phenotypic expression really varies from that woman I just spoke about who's 60 and never had a symptom that has a very bizarre ECG and a, an abnormal echo to you know, your person with a 30 millimetre septum and in, 30 millimetre septum and intractable BT. So it's a spectrum of disease and I think the important thing is once that diagnosis is made or mooted, they need follow up. And also the thing we do really poorly is familial follow up. Um, so their whole family should be screened as should, and not just their first degree relative, some would suggest that all of their cousins need to be screened as well because of the pattern of um, penetration through families. And again, um, you know, you really need to refer to a speci specialist Hockham um, clinic. And they exist in most capital cities, but um, it's not something that's well done in the general cardiology community. I mean, it's a very interesting point about athletes and what you do with them if you get a positive outcome and how you're going to restrict them. Because, I mean, now we, I don't think we've even sorted out whether they, we, we can void their contracts, whether we can assess them. There was no, um, that we were screening them, we they were under the understanding that whatever we found we would recommend, but we had no legal power to stop them continuing their SASI scholarships because they'd already been issued when, when the screening was undertaken. So, you know, I think it's a role for you know, most of us here rather than the cardiologists is we've still got to work out in some respects how all our individual sports and team sports are going to handle if we're going to do it, how we're going to handle the, the positive athletes and restricting their sports. Is it, you know, I'm not too sure what the AFL would have in their contracts, but I would doubt that if you screen them after the contracts were issued, that you'd be able to revoke their contracts. So they would be competing at their own risk. Um, we've got a couple of examples uh, in Adelaide. Um, I, I certainly know of one young lad who was at SASI some years ago who was diagnosed with Marfan syndrome and was, was advised of all the inherent risks of sudden death. And he and his parents both accepted those risks and continued to play basketball. As far as I'm aware, he still does, but no longer as part of the sports institute. So I think it'll, come, it'll most likely come down to informed consent that if, if someone was discovered to have one of these conditions, um, we'd, um, we'd do it with the uh, in, information and advice as to their risk of sudden death if they so choose to continue playing. Um, I don't think we can stop them, and, but we'll obviously undertake measures to uh, ensure that we minimise that risk with you know, having defibrillators around. Just on that point of defibrillators, if you walk around any major capital city, particularly in Europe, they're everywhere. Um, when I was in Monaco, I, I counted at least eight um, defibrillators just sit, sitting on walls in malls and train stations, etc. And, and there's a big push certainly there, again, by the Italians. They have lots of defibrillators all distributed around the community, so I think that's something that we could run right to. Thanks, Mark. Uh, any other questions? Uh, maybe uh, come up to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a little bit about screening and use of ECGs. We have so many different ECGs, and the lead placement can vary. So, how are we going to get that? 
Uh, just, I don't know if your voice was that loud, Maddie. Uh, oh, sorry. I think I heard it. I think the question was about leg placement and how you standardise it. Well, the answer is there, I mean, there are standard, there's a standard way that you should do an ECG, and if you don't understand it, you need to be trained. Um, to the trained eye, you can usually detect if there's been a, a bug or problem with leg placement, such as limb lead reversal, but sometimes there can be more subtle abnormalities. And I think it's a really important point. And I think what's going to happen with um, screening, say if you know, clubs decide to take them on board and they purchase an ECG machine for $6,000 and then get someone to run around and collect them, you might end up with some spurious ECGs. So I think, you know, it, you can Google how to do an ECG and it explains it very clearly. Um, so I think it's important that, you know, whoever's doing it is actually consistent and doing it properly. Thank you, Maria, for that. Sorry, Betty, what was that? What about the machine? I don't think it matters. I mean, so long as they're all set at 10 millimeters, 10 millimeters per millivolt and 25 millimeters a second, which will be spat out on any ECG machine, even if it's 50 years old, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Question down here. Hi, my name is Sharon, Fine Sports Um Can you explain that um, the statement that you need to exclude 791 to yeah, it's exactly on those figures. So if you look at the, we're talking about rare diseases. So um, uh, the prevalence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is something like one in 500, perhaps a bit less, perhaps a bit more in other populations. ARVC is less than one in a thousand. Um, if you use those sort of Italian figures on people who have um, possible diseases or arrhythmias and things, and then you look in the long term about how many people actually die of sudden cardiac death um, during that amount of time, you're restricting that many people from sport. So they're on the sideline, but may not necessarily um, die. There's that paper, I think the reference was in the slide. Um, yeah, it's British. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Marie, for that. Yeah, Shane. I guess this is to, uh, Shane, I guess this is to the whole panel. Um, I mean, an incredibly important topic, uh, very yeah. topical, international flow on is significant. The fact is, is that we're, we're finding it difficult here in Australia, USA and Europe for screening, yet a substantial part of the world uh, having access to ECG machines isn't easy and uh, it's probably even far more difficult to get access to cardiologists to read those. Unfortunately, the international implications are that, that rules are being made in sport for FIFA, for example, uh, where uh, screening, cardiac screening is mandatory and the implication of that is significant because of access to ECG machines and access to uh, good reading. Uh, I mean, I, I think you've just got to do what you can and obviously, you know, with some geographic challenges it's really hard as is follow-up in, in some geographic locations and Mark alluded to the fact before that at the moment in Australia you could say it's discriminatory because we're only screening elite teams because they have the money, they can pay $30 per player or whatever it is to, to have their ECGs done. So there's always going to be some disparity. I think if a decision has been made to, to try to screen, you just do the best that you can. Um, you know, there, there are ways around it. There are you know, cheap ECG machines that you can get, but I realise that's often not feasible. So. And as, as I alluded in my talk, the infrastructure required was um, beyond, would be beyond most Australian sporting teams. And so we should be well organised. But in that respect, it would be very hard to convince the Australian <coughs> government to fund this sort of project, I would suspect, because you know, we haven't decided what we're going to do with our positive athletes. And I think if you look at it, um, if you compared uh, ECG screening for sudden cardiac death in athletes to some of the cancer screening programs, there's no way that government would support it on a, on a mercenary basis. It's, a very, it's very topical, it's very emotive when someone young dies, but really when you balance it up against other screening programs, it just pales into insignificance. And I think the reason it keeps coming up is because it is, it is so emotive. Um, the other problem now is, is, is a bit political. Uh, a lot of the um, Australian organisations like College of Sports Physicians and the Athletic Medical Officers Association are, are being pushed to put out um, policy statements about this and they're all a bit um, gun shy as to how, to how to portray it and, how to, uh, and as to what to say because um, internationally there's a lot of pressure that we should be participating in these screening programs and that's one of the reasons why I, I looked at AFL and thought well where's our um, 
duty of care at that level of sport. So um, it, it's really opening up a whole new can of worms in Australia. But I mean, other countries have been doing it fairly successfully, and, I, and I'm quite encouraged by Bill's program in the state of Texas, bigger than uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, bigger than the population of Australia. So, so I, th I think you know, whilst it's uh, it, it could be um, it could be get a little bit tricky. I think we've still got to face the issue. Australia's nicer enough. Um, I, I will say though, too, just to add a postscript to that, the struggles with broad screening, notwithstanding clinically, we still need the research. In this. We still need to answer some of these fundamental questions on natural history, on conversion, things like that. I realize it's a fine line, but that in the Texas projects, our first question is research and providing the service, but it's not a mandatory or anything else. It's a community-based screen. They answer some additional questions. And you're, I mean, I mean, as I said, your study's fantastic, and that's what's lacking is what happens in the long term, and is it feasible to follow people up? Um, and certainly, you know, our experience in Australia has been even with relatively good resources. Kids are hard to find, and Australia's a big place. So, for instance, the AFL draft camp gets screened every year, and then they all disappear off to, you know, deep Northern Territory and you can't find them. <laughs> like it's actually logistically really challenging and we don't know what happens in the long term. So that kind of data is going to be fantastic to see. Um, if David, David Paul's so really, really more common, if I may, the, um, the two sudden sporting related deaths we've had in Victoria in the last five years have been in people under 18. So I think that's a, certainly an important area of focus. And I guess that also helps with the issue of putting in advice these people. And I think picking them up if we can at that time when they're still under parental influence and the discussion can be balanced and they haven't differentiated that and ended up in that pathway where all other doors are necessarily shut to pursue education, I think it's really important. So um, we're certainly at AFL Victoria undertaking this screening, so we do pick one up. It's not as much of a challenge, I mean it's certainly been a challenge for kids that are being drafted, but uh, um, I would encourage people to really look at that, that group because so I think that's where the goals are. Yeah, absolutely. And once you get to a young, to an older age group, they're almost self-selected. So we're talking about the AFL, um, professional AFL players, if most of those are in their 20s. Yeah. So, you know, the, you're missing, it would be unusual to, it's not surprising that you haven't identified anyone with happening yet because they probably would have declared themselves as people. Not always, but, you know, you're looking at a self-selected population once you get into the older group. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, um, uh, it behoves us to probably at least uh, focus on our under 18 competition um, as a, again as a sort of a first line and make sure that you know again it's not a really not a very really large group um, they can easily undergo go to screening and see if that can um, influence other other sports in the state as well. David, who funds that program and um, who do they have one cardiologist look at it? I and that's a good question at the moment. Uh, it's been done privately. The kids are, uh, I've, I explained the situation at the parents' night. Um, we make it voluntary. Uh, we haven't got to the level of making it compulsory. Although, generally, it's done because it will be either be done at draft combine. Um, so, um, the parents are happy usually to do it at the start of the year. Um, so, the cell phone at the moment, we're looking at a way of making it more cost effective and efficient. Um, the dilemma we ran into, it was very easy, we've got in Victoria, we've got uh, the metro kids and then the kids are scattered in the country. Where I ran into trouble was the country kids who took the form to their GP that I generated uh, or a local pathology provider, and this is a trap um, which goes to making sure that you have a relationship with the cardiologist because in, in private pathology companies, the ECGs are auto-read and the report comes out of the little software that's in the uh, ECG and the four abnormals that I had were in the country kids. And when I ring up the cardiologist, all the cardiologist does is validate the report that comes out of the machine. And when I said to him, were you aware these kids were athletes? He said, no, I didn't even see the, um, no, you don't the referral. Have, I made that point, you don't see the referral when you're reporting, but you don't just sign, unless you're a muppet, you don't just sign what the <laughs> auto report has spat out. So the auto report might have said LVH on voltage criteria, sinus bradycardia, abnormal ECG. And if you don't know that they're an athlete, it probably is abnormal. Well, as so I explained, that's a really important yeah. point. You can't send it off to a pathology collection centre and think that you're going to get a proper report back unless they know it's an athlete and unless you make it clear. Yeah. And when I said to the cardiologist, you realise you've just ruined this kid's career. 
I said, oh, I'll get it out and read it again. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Thank you. That's a good point, you uh, know. Um, I think the danger in this story is what you 791 false positives for every <coughs> true positive. And we have to think there's a harm in missing someone, there's a harm in a false negative, but there's also a big harm in the false positives who otherwise may not be exercising, they're going to pay a lifestyle cost for that, they might even pay a mortality cost for that. And it takes a long time to work that out. You know, we've just come to the stage where we've been doing um, prostate-specific antigen screening, that's the new, new thing for middle-aged men, my, myself, and you know, the story is starting to say that maybe that is potentially more harmful or beneficial. So I think there's a big challenge in these false positives, isn't it, in excluding people from something that they They're enjoy. not all necessarily false positives. You may have identified someone with disease, but someone with subtle disease that may never have actually died yeah. of sudden cardiac death. Um, and we don't, it's, it's a really important area to think about, but again, hard to look at longitudinally. It just reminds me too, that was, I'd take middle-aged, uh, the middle-aged bit as a compliment, Maria, even though in Lycra it perhaps wasn't meant that way, but anyway, a bit earlier. Are there any other questions? Andrew. Andrew Garner. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Maria and Bill made the other two best this one. We've had the focus on the athletes, and obviously we've increasingly got the microscope on that group. But, uh, as is the focus of this conference, we've got an increasing number of people who are doing less and less activity. So if you like, the norms of fitness are being downgraded all the time. But we have an obesity crisis in the certain days in Australia and the United States. Uh, people have been driven to suddenly take up exercise such as boot camp. Is there any indication that there's excess risk of hearing from that? And are there perhaps screening abnormalities that may be seen in that group if we need to adjust the community screening criteria? So for example, a female under 25, a BMI of over 30, should they also be screened prior to undertaking often very rigorous exercise? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I guess I can answer part of that. Yeah, I can answer part of that. Um, not about the, the woman with the BMI of 40 under the age of 25, I think. You, know, you just need to give someone sensible advice when they start an exercise program. As I alluded to at the start of the presentation, there's a lot of interest in um, the old leisure athletes and there's sort of booming uh, participation rates in marathons and you know, triathlons. And certainly there's an indication that the death rates during those events might be slightly on the increase. And unfortunately, most of those deaths are due to premature coronary disease, but most often in people who've had no symptoms prior, and most often because of rupture of a previously non-critical narrowing. So again, any screening, this is a massive debate, um, and this is, as I said, what the Europeans are starting to focus on. I think they're getting sick of the under 35s now. Um, but the question is, can you can you identify these people who are at high risk? And traditional things like exercise stress testing are actually really useless because you need to have a critical coronary narrowing at the time of exercise to, to see anything. Um, things like coronary CT and, and coronary calcium scoring may be helpful, but again, there's some problems with large amounts of false positives. Um, so. The sort of pragmatic approach is anyone who um, is over the age of 40 and has any cardiac risk factors or a family history and is about to in suddenly increase the amount of exercise they do, um, they should probably have um, you know, at least a medical checkup. But again, it's really hard to predict who these people are, who the people who are going to go plonk are. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of interest in that at the moment. How many risk factors would you say before they can do that? Because oh, there's the some respect. guidelines, but they're just guidelines. Uh, and, and again, the Americans and the Europeans are different, but if you're, I think, for instance, type intensive diabetic over the age of 45 and want to take up at least moderate exercise, which is jogging, uh, then they suggest you should have an examination, a stress test, and an ECG. But again, a stress ECG is often a really unhelpful test. My understanding is two risk factors that they recommend, but exercise and age is a risk factor, so it's really <laughs> so uh, we've got about a minute to, to go. Are there any other uh, any other questions or any other comments? Um, just one quick one, just maybe for the guys, perhaps more on the end, maybe for Maria. But um, viral illness, myocarditis, just should players play? Uh, do they need to have a fever? Is there a worry? Is there a correlation? Is it they've been sick a week ago and it's post illness? You know what? As as doctors for teams, how strict should we be about sickness, illness in players and, and, and playing? Well, certainly my policy is any, anyone with an acute febrile illness, we don't allow them to train or play. 
the big question is uh, how long after. Um, most viral illnesses that, that I see in you know, football, they're usually only febrile for 24 or 48 hours and it settles. Um, and, and you know, if that happens to be on a Friday afternoon and they're playing Saturday or Sunday, there's always the pressure are they, are they fit to play. I, again, I've relied very much on the symptoms that they're still on, well, I don't have to play anyway. Um, uh, but you know, occasionally I play the ball, um, and it just cross my fingers. Um, but I'm assuming that you know, within sort of five to seven days, the majority, that the risk is significantly less unless you bring lots of time otherwise. Yeah, look, I think I'd agree with that. I and mean, we, we don't know the, the strict answer to that question, but I think it's a really sensible advice if you're if febrile and feeling crook, don't play because you are at increased risk. Um, and if you've had a viral illness recently and something's not right, like you've been noticing that you've been having a few palpitations or you're feeling a bit more out of breath, then that's not normal. But the issue with um, elite athletes, as Mark suggested, is that they under-report symptoms. Um, so some, you know, you can't always catch them, but um, it's something to be aware of. But it is a, it is a condition that exists. All right, one more. We've got time. One more. One quick one. Hi, Sandy Major at Sports, Dr. Marie. This is a, just a quick question. I know we don't have the exact answer to this. Through the evidence, but at what age would you start screening genes? Yeah, look, I think 14 is probably a reasonable age. There's no answer to that question, but I think under the age of 14, you are really going to get a lot of false positives. Um, unfortunately, you know there will be a number of kids who, who have diseases that aren't identified between the age of 12 and 14 and die very young, but that's that's more rare. And I think in terms of um, practicality and ease of screening, and and really, if you pick your where your best detection rates are going to be, it's pretty much from upwards. We, the study that I've run, <coughs> mostly to get it through ethics, we said from 16 years upwards um, because we would have had to involve parental consent and then also deal with potentially more false positives in that 14 to 16 year old category. From what I've seen, there's a bunch of 14 year old ECGs have also been sent along the way. Um, it, then it's, they're not too hard to look at and I think 14 is probably a pretty reasonable age. But that's, that's an asymptomatic kid, so if you know, you know you've got a, Child that you see who has a family history or have had symptoms, that's good. Seeing as Chief only got eight minutes, he can, he can have the last word. No, I was just want to ask Marie another question. In her studies, has she seen any Australian ethnicity uh, differences with Polynesians and, and uh, Islanders and yeah, such? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question, and, and I thought maybe we would have by now. We've had about 120 either Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander or Pacific Islander Maori athletes screened. Um, the answer is no, they've actually had a lower incidence overall of ECG abnormalities, but a large proportion of those have been sub elite kids from the AFL draft camp. We're running a separate study of looking at exactly that with um, Indigenous Australian um, athletes. Um, I think there are some subtle differences that are, emerge are emerging, but I don't think we're going to see the same sort of very distinct patterns that you see with like African athletes. But as I said, I think they're, they're a different population that their cardiac risk, risk profile is completely different to Caucasians. Right. I think we better wind up there um, and thank you very much to all the speakers.